For 29 years, Wentworth's West Course has been the venue of a unique event in international golf. The Toyota World Match Play Championship brings together each year the best players in the world in head-to-head -head competition. It's an annual examination, not just of golfing skill, but of character. Seeded number one this year is the defending champion, Severiano Ballesteros, whose love of match play is well known. He enjoys the cut and thrust of knockout golf, and although not enjoying his best season, he's enthusiastically looking forward to scoring a record-breaking sixth win. It was back in 1981 that he won his first title, beating Ben Crenshaw, amazingly the last American to reach the final. Last year, Seve equaled Gary Player's five wins record. Seeded to meet Seve in the final is the world number one Nick Faldo, who won in 1989 but has lost two other finals. This will be his 13th appearance and he hopes it will not be an unlucky one for him. Already this season in Europe, he's won four times, no more dramatically than in the Open Championship at Muirfield in July. These days, he's being compared for dedication and sheer professionalism to Ben Hogan. There could be no greater tribute. Another 35-year-old, Nick Price from Zimbabwe, is seeded number three by virtue of his first major win, the US PGA at Belle Reve in St. Louis in August. Last year, he lost in the final to Seve when he just ran out of putts and birdies. But coached like Faldo by David Ledbetter, Price has no need to fear anyone. His technique is sound and on the greens, he often has that magic touch. The fourth seed is another Spaniard, Jose Maria Olazabal, Sebi's Ryder Cup partner, hoping to find the form at Wentworth, which gave him two early season victories. The top four seeds are not involved in opening day action. The first round draw brings together eight other players with records to be proud of. Sluman against Singh, Suzuki against Woosnam, Faxon against Norman, Forsbrand against O'Meara. Noted for his consistency on the US tour, Sluman, runner-up to Tom Kite at Windlash Pebble Beach in the US Open this year, has played in the event before, and more importantly, enjoys match play. He always had the upper hand on Singh, who won the German Open by 11 shots this year, but it somehow, at Wentworth, mislaid his normally reliable putting touch. In the end, Singh bowed out gracefully, a four and three victim of the American whose only win on the US tour was the US PGA Championship in 1988. Norio Suzuki's task against the longer hitting Ian Woosnam was always going to be difficult. The 40 year old Japanese winner of 20 titles in his career knew that it would take extraordinary golf to beat Woosnam who rates Wentworth's West Course as one of his favorites and who on form can be devastating. Suzuki did his best, but course expert Woosnam, setting up birdie chances with brilliant iron play, was never in trouble. The Welshman also rediscovered the putting touch, which had deserted him so often in 1992, and ran out an easy winner, eight and six. Three times title winner Greg Norman's opponent was Slim Brad Faxon, the 31-year-old American whose confidence had been boosted by two late summer title successes in the States. Autumn in England can be cold and damp, but Faxon, enjoying his first visit to Wentworth, quickly settled to the task of trying to beat an opponent who knew the West Course much better. Norman, finally out of his two-year slump, showed he'd lost none of his skill at playing bunker shots, but the American was unimpressed. He capitalized on any chances he set up. It was always going to be a close tie. With me, Dave Marr. Dave, an important tie for Greg Norman. Unquestionably, that's true. The win, though, at the Canadian Open, written in a playoff with Bruce Litsky, absolutely has done wonders for the way Greg looks now getting to the golf course. He looks like he's ready to play. And today, watching him, though his bunker play has been splendid, I've noticed that he's just not hitting the ball quite as solid as he was just a couple of weeks ago, not turning as well. Nevertheless, Norman won by one hole, but he did have a problem, a neck problem which required immediate treatment after the tie. Still, he was through to the next round. The remaining first round tie, a transatlantic affair between Sweden's Anders Forsbrand and America's Mark O'Meara proved even closer. This year in Europe, Forsbrand has had two wins, two second place finishes and made eight other top ten checks. 
On his debut at Wentworth, he was looking for a win to have the chance to take on Nick Faldo in the quarterfinals. O'Meara had his target too. He knew no American had won the trophy since Bill Rogers in 1979, and he wanted to put that right if he could. The west course is cut through what used to be, centuries ago, a massive forest. There are fewer trees today, but winning round Wentworth is dependent on keeping the ball in play, because every hole is tree-lined. Mark O'Meara did it rather better than Forsbrand, and needed this butt on the 37th to finally shake off his talented opponent. So two of the three American challengers through to round two, and a reminder of the first day results. Sluman, a four and three winner, Woosner winning out in the country, Norman scraping home at the 36th, and O'Meara needing an extra hole. And this the second round lineup. Sebi Ballesteros against Sluman, Olathabal in against Woosnam, Price against Norman, and Faldo against O'Meara. And there was early drama on day two. Norman had had ultrasound treatment on that neck injury, but operating on only half power, he was forced to pull out in pain while playing the sixth. He was the first player forced to withdraw through injury since the event began in 1964. Ian Woosnam had coasted to victory over Suzuki, but he anticipated that Olathabo would provide sterner opposition. The Spaniard has been struggling for inspiration this year, but is still ahead of the Welshman in the Sony World Rankings. Woosnam wanted to prove the organisers wrong in not seeding him ahead of Olathabo, and he produced Dave Marr, some of the best golf ever seen at Wentworth. There's no player in the world that, when he gets on a run, is going to beat this man. Woosnam was absolutely magnificent, both in the first round and the second round, and maybe he was proving something about the seeding procedure. Great putter, but also a great swinger of the golf club. It's the simplest looking swing, and as I said, when he gets on a run and gets in full flight, he just makes so many birdies, he reduces the golf course to what you think is just a short course instead of one of the great inland golf courses in the world. Have a good view of his swing there, just a played shot. And just watch how this finishes. Again, so many marvelous shots, you didn't even have to putt extremely well. Well, when he was conceded a record seventh birdie in a row at the 29th hole, Olathabal had been well and truly beaten, and he knew it. <laughs> On day one, Woosnam had thrown 11 birdies at Suzuki in 30 holes. Against Olathabal, he made 12 in 29 holes, plus an eagle. The question was, could anyone stop him in that kind of form? Woosnam, an 8-7 and seven winner. Mark O'Meara had arrived at Wentworth via Japan, where just five days earlier he'd won the Tokai Classic. He now had the task of stopping Faldo, the pre-tournament favourite. Awesome enough when you're playing really well, more difficult when you hit the odd wayward shot. Now, where did that one go? Did anyone see it? Even O'Meara couldn't quite work out what had happened to that one. The ball had taken a bad bounce, perhaps, or had he put a bad swing in it? In contrast, Faldo, who had pulled out the previous week's event in Stuttgart, citing mental exhaustion as the cause, was back to his best. That putt didn't drop, Dave, but uh, it was an immaculate performance against Amira by Faldo. Well, he's the world's number one player, and it's just such a mechanical performance that he gives every time he plays. He, too, is just beautiful to watch, though he may not make as many birdies as Woosnam and when Woosnam is hot, he just grinds you slowly, just inexorably. In the end, the American Amera just could not match Faldo's precision play. The Open champion, just twice outside the top eight in European appearances this year, scored a comfortable five and three success. Sebi Ballesteros knew that victory against Sluman might depend more on his amazing competitiveness rather than the brilliance of his golf. Sluman, he knew, was a tough competitor, a solid, reliable shot maker. And Sluman, he knew, rather relished the role of underdog. Sevi had the better record, but Sluman was determined to beat him. 
Too often in 1992, Dave Maher, the Spanish genius, has looked lost and has confessed that he's been playing a game to which he's not accustomed. It doesn't look like he's as comfortable playing the game as he was earlier in his career. I think he's listening to too many people instead of just playing his natural game with a lot of feel. Seve lost four holes quickly. Sluman had his slice of luck. But typically, the Spaniard had fought back by the 18th to square the match. Seve may not have been at his best, but he never gives in. And that's why the fans love him. In the afternoon, he went one up, but the old waywardness was there too. A fragility that would, in the end, cost him the chance of a record sixth success. He took Sluman all the way, but it was the American who would win. Seve has had many great victories on that last green, but on this occasion, Jeff Sluman won by two holes. So let's just check the second round results. Sluman getting through, Woosnam winning again, Price winning after just five holes, and Faldo, an easy winner over Amera. So to the semi-finals, Jeff Sluman representing America against Ian Woosnam, Nick Price against Nick Faldo. Semi-final day dawned grey and cold. The tournament had already attracted record crowds and in what is Southeast England's stockbroker belt, even the youngsters show early signs of entrepreneurial skills. Sadly, Woosnam seemed to have left his golfing skills at home. He'd shot 23 birdies and an eagle in 59 holes on the first two days, but was even finding pars tough to make at times in the semi-final. It was proof again that golf is a fascinatingly frustrating and quite unpredictable game. Wisdom had, in fact, won three of the first seven holes, but at the end of the first 18 of the 36-hole match, he was one down to Sluman. And after the 11th hole in the afternoon, he was four down. He won back two holes, but was still two down, with five regulation holes to play. This par three, uphill, 179 yards to a two-tiered green, is played difficult to get close to all week. As we've seen so many hit on the top level. You go through the green, leaving yourself a fast little pitch down the hill. Club selection so important here, and Sluman's let his get away to the right, and again, just as Ian did, when you hit up on the top level, it goes through the green. Meanwhile, in the other semi-final, Nick Price playing his fourth shot to the 12th, par five, drove into the hazard, or oh, playing it rather well. Super shot there, getting his par five. Faldo only once won up in this semi-final, and that was after just two holes. This is Faldo's third. Needs a buddy to take the lead for only the second time in the match. And that one day of running just a little bit further past the pin than he had anticipated it would. Now tough chipping off the lie that he had just in the light rough and downhill always makes it run a little bit harder than you expect. Meanwhile, forward to the 14th, Jeff Sluman second. From beyond and to the right of the pin. And a beautiful little shot it is. For some match play, Ian, the sportsman that he is, gives him that. Now, Ian's got a delicate little shot here, Ren. But quickly, back to the 12th, where Nick Faldo has this birdie putt to go one up. Oh, what an important hole for Faldo, who lost in the semi-finals last year to Price, five and three. Faldo won up, six to play. And ahead at the 14th, Woosnam with a very touchy little shot here, just a little fluffy, just want to carry it on. 
oh, and it hit soft on him. It's a little bit unlucky. Now he's left himself with one of those right-breaking putts. It seemed to be always harder for the right-handed player. Ken, his caddy, has spent a lot of time on this, and you certainly don't want to miss this and go three down with four to play. This is a must-make. He's lost the magic. He's lost the momentum. Sluman wins the hole in three. Three up. And Sluman remained three up after 33. Nick Price and Nick Faldo halved two more holes. Faldo one up with four regulation holes to play. And Faldo split the middle of the fairway with a fine drive at 15 and now with a four iron to play a second shot. Starting just to the right, and you can hear Nick say, go. And go it did. Playing the contour, and like a man who does play here quite a bit, getting the member bounce, if you will. And a fine golf shot. Well, Nick Price using a five iron for his second shot at Wentworth's 15th. That's heading for sand straight in. I'd hope to use the contours as Nick Faldo did, bounce it off the bank of that bunker and bring it down to the pin. It didn't work out for him. This at the 16th. Well, remember, Woosnam three down. Still a chance of a birdie there for the Welshman. Funny how Thursday and Friday he could do no wrong, and today just missing slightly, but just enough to be three down to Jeff Sluman. Sluman's second shot here, a little uphill. Maybe a little too safe there. You don't want to allow any kind of little charge to take place. Awkward little shot for Price, Dave. Yes, the lip just there, but uh, the good news is it's a good line, an uphill line. Brenton, it's almost you can't put these guys in bunkers anymore and not have them get it up with a makeable putt. He's not happy with that. I think you and I would be very happy with that. I would be. Fowler looking at his putt, still to come, and uh, ahead on the 16th, Jeff Sluman. Pacing around his putt, the putt that could win him the tie. But on the 15th, the 33rd hole of his match with Nick Faldo, Price has this for par. Well, the chance, Dave, for Nick Faldo to move into a two-hole lead. You just can't give a player this caliber, that, that opening, after He'd hit a good shot in there, and then Nicky Price puts it in the bunker. Oh, he just tickled that one down to the hole. A birdie three. And Nick Faldo, for the first time in the semifinal, goes two up. Ahead at 16, Jeff Sluman, very underrated player, simply because he's won just once, but a marvelous putter. Oh, no, how did that not drop? That would have won him the tie, but he still has the chance of winning here yeah, because Ian Woosner must hold this birdie putt to stay alive. And nothing that has happened today would suggest, Dave Maher, that uh, he's going to hold it. Just think that the law of averages would help you here, but of course this is must make or bye bye. Oh, we give it a chance, but it's bye bye. Ian Woosnam, twice winner of the world match play title, loses three and two to the American Jeff Sluman.
And Jeff becomes the first American to play in the final since Ben Crenshaw back in 1981. Well, we know one finalist, Nick Faldo, has the upper edge in his match with Sluman. Now it's 17. Par five, this is his third shot. Half the 16th, the 34th hole of the semi-final. Tough hole this one, Dave, isn't it? 571 yards and the fairway slopes from the player left to right. Of course, Nick has the problem now. He's got to win this hole in order to keep going. All right. I think that told you all you needed to know, Renton. I pulled it. I think Price probably affected by the fact that he had only five competitive rounds in his quarterfinal against... Greg Norman really needed a good match against Norman to get himself sharp to take on Faldo. Just for the win. It's always to the right. Speed perfect. A par for Nick Faldo. That little putt conceded as you can do in match play. And now Price. This must go in. He now in the situation that uh, Ian Woosnam was at the 16th against Sluman. It's all over. Nick Faldo has reached the final. His fourth world match play final. He beats Nick Price by two and one and gains revenge for his defeat by Price in the semi-final last year. No surprise, he's the world's number one player, not only by the rankings, but the other players feel that. So Nick Faldo will meet Jeff Sluman in the 36-hole final. So the first transatlantic final since 1981. And a bit of a surprise in Jeff Sluman, a young man who grew up in New York, now lives in Florida at 5'7". Very underrated player, a bit of a surprise, playing the world's number one ranked player and the player who many think is the player to watch for years to come, going for his second title. Nick Faldo won the first three holes, went four up after eight, and after 15 was three up on the American. On the 16th tee, Sluman. Three hundred and eighty yards, par four. A hole that uh, is sometimes more awkward than uh, it really looks. This is caused by the bunker that you'll see just down the left-hand side, just to the right of Faldo. There now, he's going with an iron off of this tee, which you've seen a lot of players do. He needs to pull himself together a little bit. He's struggling here in the later stages of the morning round. Four up after 12 holes. Four under par at that stage. Fine tee shot there. Fowler then dropped a shot at the 13th. He got a half. Dropped a shot at 14 and got a half. And then took six at 15 and lost the hole. Mike Stewart of the PGA European Tour. The official referee. Faldo first to go. Now that's a little more like Nick Faldo's swing. Six iron. And a magnificent shot. Often in different stretch of holes at 13, 14, and 15. Now, Sluman can't afford to go to lunch too many down. This then, after a drive, this is an eight iron second. See the flag just over the bunker. Look like he took that back a little outside, and generally with a short iron, when you do that, you pull it. And those aren't the kind of shots that are going to get you very far, Jim. Twice runner-up this year in the U.S. Of course, at the U.S. Open, most notably. 
battled with Faldo and did at that US PGA Championship, uh, which he won at Oak Tree in Oklahoma in 1988. This then for a birdie three. seem to run right up to the edge of the hole and then roll back away from the hole. So I think you could uh, say Davey was pretty unlucky there. A little unlucky, but you get those things, especially if you're not going well. This to go four up. Absolutely into the middle of the hole. He doesn't let opportunities pass him by on the golf course. Well, walking with a very positive uh, stride down to the tee at the 17th. Par 5, dog leg. And uh, the second shot blind over a hill. People are starting to compare Nick with my favorite golfer of all time, Ben Hogan. A little more expression from Nick than you would ever have found Hogan do, but you can see just in the left side of the fairway, this fairway slopes quite a bit from left to right. That's one reason this hole plays hard. He's got the same tunnel vision though, hasn't he? That's the part I see, the concentration, the ability to block out what you've done or what others are doing. Looking at it rather anxiously, but that's fine. If it just stays in that light rough, oh well, it's gone into the deeper stuff. So uh, a bit of a problem for Sluman there, but a bit of a problem too for Faldo because he is on the wrong side of the fairway, and he will have to shape his shot quite dramatically around the corner, Dave. Hard to do, too, when you're trying to play a hook and the ball is below your feet. Sometimes your heel or your club will catch, and you'll hit a very quick hook. You've got to guard against that here. Now, the pin is right away round the corner there. The ground goes up and then falls down towards the green. Well, I hope that's bending round. From his look, it's not bending enough for him. That see where it finishes. Just in the right rough, clear right. Sluman now. Little chance of getting up with an iron today. Certainly from that lie. Well short. So both will still have wedge shots uh, to this green. This hole playing much longer in the autumn than it sometimes does uh, in past championships. We've seen players through the green in two. Plus a lot of rain that uh, you've had. Now this shot, Jeff needs to carry it back to the hole, even though this green slopes away from you a little. Still receiving the shots very well, especially a wedge from the fairway. And he didn't hit it hard enough. How intimidating is it uh, for a player to be up against Nick Faldo with the reputation that he now has, Dave? Retton, I think that's who you want to play. If you're going to find out about yourself, wouldn't you rather beat Nick Faldo than anyone playing golf today? I mean, if you could. And this is a wonderfully played shot, even though Nick growling like some kind of bear back there. Well played out of the rough. Yes, yeah, a different type of shot from the one that Sluman played. Sluman's shot stopped very quickly. Faldo's, as you saw, ran on and up to the hole. Bit of a swing on this putt. They say the strong part of Jeff's game is his putting. Didn't quite borrow enough on this occasion. So he will have to make do with uh, a par five, that little putt conceded by Faldo. And Faldo now has the chance to go five up. 
This could suddenly turn into a rout. Interesting to see Fanny Sunison, Faldo's caddy, helping him with the line. Sometimes she does, sometimes she doesn't. If she helped, it's dead center. That's what I mean about Hogan, like he's so methodical and he just doesn't waste any opportunities and plays smartly and plays the correct shot, just like the third shot that he played there out of the rough, letting the ball trickle down to the hole. We rejoin the game at the 18th. Jeff Sluman in the left rough. Second shot, uh, he's got to hit it really well to get it on the green. Oh, he's hit it marvelously. Flying out of that longer grass, Dave. Well, that's what you have to hope for. It's uh, when you've driven and you've got a two iron in your hand, that's well played. That's uh, smart play between the bunkers. Sluman, of course, grew up on a difficult course, Oak Hill in Rochester, New York. Faldo with a four iron. I think you'll see much the same kind of shot here. Once again, using the contours of the, the ground. Uh, he knows this course so well, he doesn't play too many fun games on it. He is a member of the Wentworth Club, but he's played so often here in tournaments. And this, of course, is 13th world match play. Sponsored by Toyota. Sluman now. And he badly needs to do something here before lunch. It's quite fast down by the hole. Ball almost seemed to gather a bit of speed in the last seven or eight feet. And he's got an awkward little one coming back. But he won't need to hold the one coming back if Faldo pops this in for an eagle. Good. Good speed, but never did move like he was expecting. And you can see from the raised eyebrows, it fooled him a little. Well, that would have been his second uh, eagle of this inward nine because he eagled the long twelfth. So Dave Sluman has to hold this putt to avoid going six down at lunch. Well, he hasn't made anything uh, spectacular, and you're right, he's got to make this to... Ball look like that went a little left even. Well, you just can't give those away. Three putts or not make any, not against a player of Faldo's caliber for sure. Frustration for Jeff Sluman. And Dave, I wonder if anybody can give Nick Faldo a six-up start with 18 holes to play. Well, if there is, I sure would say call me and I'm in the book. So to the afternoon round in this 36-hole final with Faldo a very comfortable six-up. And he continues. This is a very Albert strong Jeff starting hole. 471 yard par four. In the old days, it used to be a par five, but now a tough par four, certainly for the members. Well, I can't tell. From that exactly does it look real happy and he's in the left hand rough and that can really get you in trouble at this long hole written this is my first look at Wentworth and I just think it's one of the finest golf courses I've ever seen it's in good condition go on hard I think probably David uh, tests you it was designed by Harry Colt mm -hmm. And it, it tests you, your ability to play every club, doesn't it? It does, and it gives you openings into the green. And there's very few bunkers, certainly not like a, what we see so much of at home that I'm tired of looking at, uh, so many bunkers. The ones that are here are definitely in play. 
Second shot uh, from Nick Faldo. Oh, that one fairly skipped on through, but uh, it won't run down the hill. Someone surely will have stopped it. And uh, what went wrong there, he asks. So Sluman uh, short of the green and uh, Faldo through. Sluman to play first. Beautifully played. Oh, what a beautiful shot. Well, that's what you need. After the way he putted this morning, he cannot leave himself too many uh, putts here to have to make. And he's got to get something started right away. He's got to win this hole. He's got to jump out, win the second or third hole, get off to a start, and let Nick know he's really in a game here. Awkward little shot for Fowler, but again, played so well. Well, that answers my question and Sluman's question, too. Oh, Fowler not giving much away. No, if you're going to beat Faldo, you're going to have to do it a brick at a time. I mean, it's just, it's, he's not going to hand it to you. Short second, par three over the road, plateau green. Big bunker guarding the green on the right-hand side. Well, it didn't bite. These uh, greens just a little bit harder, despite all the rain. They're running right to the back of the green and giving him a very difficult long putt down the green. Very fast putt. So the chance for Sluman, if he can get close to the pin, to get one of those holes back. Oh, and he got a pretty good break there, actually, Renton. That was not, not a very good shot with a short iron. Is this the only match play tournament that you have uh, on the European tour? We used to have a match play championship, but uh, that was discontinued. Yes, this is the only one. You don't have one at all in America. No, and it's a shame, too, because the fans love them. Players don't. Uh, <laughs> They're not so keen when they haven't got the card and pencil in their hands. What a marvellous putt there by Faldo. So relaxed. A couple of inches, tap in, par three. But uh, Sluman has the chance of a birdie. And he can't afford to miss any of his chances. One of the few times that he's had a chance to win a hole. So many great games, so many great matches around this course over the years. Ah, short. He knows that he blew that chance. Faldo remains six up. Well, Renton, I've noticed in match play, when you drive last and putt first, you don't generally win. You've got to get the honor and be the one that's putting last on the green. The third hole, the 21st, is a halved. Faldo remains six up. And we rejoin the match at the fourth. Reachable par five. Little stream down in the bottom of the valley, which doesn't uh, bother the professionals, but that's not a good shot from Sluman. It really is quite cold and uh, unpleasant now. But Faldo in the perfect position, Dave, off the tee. Perfect, but this lie might produce a shot left to right. Let's see what he does. No, he starts it to the right, and he may have lost this out there. Went to the bunker. Yeah, a little bit perfect position in a sense. It's just that his stance with the ball so far below his feet caused him a little problem. Sluman's third shot now. Played a wonderful chip at the first hole. Pitch, let's see what this does. No, even playing it well short with the damp conditions, you can just see how much that runs away from him. Not well played. And again, you leave the door, you can see his caddy, Tony, there, who used to caddy for Crenshaw. I wonder if he caddied for Crenshaw when uh, he was in the final in 1981. Somehow doubted. I don't know that for sure. But here's another area of this man's golf game that's outstanding. Yes. Well, well. Oh, 
relentless. He just never gives you an opening. And Sloman concedes that putt and has a putt now for a half, a birdie half. If this doesn't go down, he's seven down. So Jeff Sluman's chance of becoming the first American since Bill Rogers in 1979 to win this title, and incidentally this year pick up 160,000 pounds, is fast disappearing. Well, Sluman may well be up against the world number one, but he does get the encouragement of uh, seeing this long putt drop at the fifth to get one hole back. and. Uh, well, he needs quite a few of them if he's going to really test Faldo over the inward stretch. But no sooner does he get uh, that little bit of encouragement than he does this at the seventh, the 25th hole of the match, failing to make the green and losing the hole. So as we rejoin the final, after 25 holes, Nick Faldo seven up, just 11 holes left to play. The eighth at Wentworth, the Burma Road, the West Course, par four. Beautiful driving hole, and not a hole where you see a player use a driver. This, an iron from Nick, two iron. Let's play it down the right-hand side as he did there. That's in beautiful shape. Not much water on this uh, West Course, unlike so many American courses, Dave, but uh, a driver here might get you into the little pond that guards it, the green. It could, but uh, again, it's not a long hole. Just position here, it's downhill on your first shot here. Sluman also with an iron. You can see taking advantage of a little of the slope there. Now your second shot goes a little bit uphill. And across the only real lake, I would say, I've ever seen on a golf, a major golf course here. There it is, you can see it. It's just a very small lake by Jack but Nicholas standards, I suppose. It's big enough to hold a golf ball, though. I know, I've been in it too often. Well, Faldo getting over the water all right, but uh, coming up just uh, on the front edge of the green and spinning back off. Well, maybe a little too cautious there because you miss, you do want to miss to the right, not the left. That brings the lake into play. He used a seven iron, Sluman with a six iron. Well, neither one of them had the right club, really. Well, the way things are going, pretty glum looking Jeff Sluman because uh, Faldo heading for what would be the biggest winning margin in a final. The previous highest winning margin was six and five by Seve against Bernard Langer in 1985. Faldo up the green. You can see how damp it is. The footprints on the putting surface are beautifully judged. Sure hasn't thrown his touch off any. Renton, he just puts the ball wonderful speed. Uh, Jeff may have gotten a little bit of a line or go to school, so to speak, there. He's got to get up and pass the hole. Got to give it a chance of getting in. Well, he got it passed, and it was very close, but it's a half. Sluman hoping to get into the American Ryder Cup team that will come to the Belfry in 1993, and they, well, on the form today, hoping that he doesn't get drawn to play Nick Faldo. I don't think anyone wants to play Nick Faldo. Second shot at nine. Just from that reaction, you know he's not liking it. It's in the right-hand bunker. I'll be on one of those planes in a minute, and I can go home where everybody loves me. <laughs> well, Nick Faldo probably never even heard the plane. His concentration as good at times as that of Jack Nicklaus. 
thought I was wrong. Just shows you that no matter who you are, you're still going to hit some questionable shots. Well, Sluman wasting no time with that bunker recovery. I think almost now facing up to the inevitable. But as a runner-up, he will win £100,000, and he, he's made a lot of friends here in Britain this week. Nick Faldo. Sluman might just hold his, Faldo might just miss. Yeah, it has to happen if Jeff's going to get back into this, but as I've said earlier, you can't always be the first one to putt Renton in match play. I mean, if he misses, then it just leaves even more of a door open for Nick. Facing the inevitable, but still battling on, refusing to give up, as you would expect of Jeff Sluman. A good par four. And Faldo has to hold this to avoid losing a hole. And that really is a killer. Those are the things that just nail it shut. Just when you think he might let his concentration wander or what have you as they go over to the 10th hole. Beautiful little par three. Yes, I make it that Faldo has lost only three holes in this final. Seven up, nine to play. <laughs> Safely onto the green. This is one of the holes that uh, Sluman won in the morning round. Like he chipped in for two. Oh, what a marvelous shot! Almost a hole in one. Look at the ball running away to the back of the green. It's about what he needs. Even his good shots uh, are the shots that he's hit well. Not that there's been a lot of. Really haven't gotten close to the hole. Do Americans, Dave, appreciate the prestige of this event, do you think? I don't think so yet. I think the Ryder Cup's going to have a lot to do with that and has had about match play. And I wish we did have a match play. Jeff may not wish there was a match play right now, but he'll have to look back on this week as I had a good week. I beat uh, Ballesteros. I beat Woosnam. Then I ran into the fastest gun, <laughs> and he shot me down. Well, Faldo to go eight up. That seemed to kiss the side of the hole, but it refused to drop. And the hole is halved in par three. And uh, Nick Faldo goes to the 11th, the 29th hole of the final with a very comfortable seven hole lead. Dog leg up the hill, par four. The green just round the corner there at the top left hand portion of the screen. Again, beautiful driving holes. The holes here framed so much by the trees. Just the one bunker to the right on the drive. Well, Fanny Sunison says great shot. And she knows Fowler's game better than most. Good spot out on the right side of the fairway there. Jeffrey, you're going to have to pull off some sort of miracles or something. Gary Player was once seven down to Tony Lima and won, but that was after 19 holes, not after 28. So Nick Faldo, who has lost a couple of World Match Play Finals, but who beat Ian Woosnam in uh, a dramatic, marvellous 1989 final by just one hole, strides up to his second shot 
with victory in sight. Starts a little to the right. You can hear him say, go on. He was saying, go on in. He was really going to slam the door shut. Yeah, a little, maybe just a little smile there from Faldo. After a couple of indifferent iron shots at 8 and 9, two good ones at 10 and 11. So Sluman now has to get uh, this even closer. This is really his uh, last chance to make the margin of uh, defeat more respectable. Oh, good shot, but not inside that of Nick Faldo. Sluman really will have to hold that putt. And he'll have to hope, too, that Nick Faldo misses his. It's getting that desperate. Uh, Faldo so much in control. If Jeff does lose, and it certainly looks like he's going to, his third uh, runner-up of the year, good solid player, 15 times in the top 20, and having by far his best year on the American Tour. But if he doesn't make this one, he'll be back on the American Tour a little, a little sooner than he expected. It is frustrating. That was well enough hit, but it's a four, and Nick Faldo now has the chance to make a birdie putt for an eight and seven victory, a record winning margin. This year he's won the Irish Open, the, the European Open, the Scandinavian Masters, and the Open. This for a fifth win in Europe. And safely home, Nick Faldo is the 1992 Toyota World Match Play Champion beating Jeff Sluman by eight and seven. A magnificent performance by the world number one. In the early days I came when, uh, you know, Seve and Norman were, really were the best, especially at match play. You know, they, you know, Seve was unbeatable at match play. I mean, he could hit it all over the course and, you know, and still make fantastic scores. And, uh, um, you know, I think, I think the conditions have obviously helped me tremendously this week. You know, the fact is it was, it was long and tough. I think I, I, I got a little bit of uh, local knowledge this morning because it was, it was so cold mm. and you know, we teed off almost an hour earlier and the ball wasn't flying as far and I think that mucked Jeff up a couple of times you know, and uh, you know, I was aware of that, that you needed to really club up, hit a one club more than what you thought and you know, it made a lot of difference. So Nick Faldo will defend the title at the 30th birthday party of one of golf's unique events, the Toyota World Match Play Championship. With thanks to Dave Maher from Wentworth, goodbye. <laughs>